Christians are being persecuted around the world, and that persecution seems to be moving closer and closer to the West. What is driving this movement, and what can we do to stop it? That's what we're going to talk about today on Crisis Point. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before I get started, just want to remind people to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, uh, don't hit the notify bell because you don't want to get bothered on your phone all the time. Also, you can follow Crisis Magazine at Crisis Mag on the various social media channels at Twitter, Facebook, MeWe, Gab, Gitter, all the different ones. We're there so you can keep up with the latest of what's going on at Crisis and around the world. Okay, so today we have a very uh, special guest, Thomas Williams. He is the author of the new book from Crisis Publications, The Coming Christian Persecution. Thomas Williams is a... Is the, first of all, he's the Rome Bureau Chief for Breitbart. He's a 2018 Visiting Research Fellow for the Center of, for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame. He's written widely on theology, philosophy, ethics, and spirituality. He teaches theology at St. John's University's Rome campus. He's done extensive media work, including serving as consultant and commentator on faith, ethics, and religion for NBC, CBS, and Sky News in the UK. And like I already mentioned, he's the author of the book, the new book, the Coming Christian Persecution from Crisis Publications. Welcome to the program, Thomas. Thank you very much, Eric. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. So I think the first question is, is there really a persecution of Christians going on today? I think most Christians in America would live their life fine. So we just assume that's probably the way it is. We don't hear much about it. So is there actually a persecution of Christians going on in the world today? Well, honestly, Eric, you couldn't have asked me a better setup question because that unfortunately is a question that everyone asks because the, uh, the answer isn't obvious, and it should be. Uh, this is really part of the paradox of the situation that we're living in right now because Christian persecution is so widespread and so the numbers are so high. Uh, there's some 360 million people in the world, Christians in the world, who live under a situation of serious to severe persecution. In other words, that they actually fear for their lives. They fear physical aggression against their persons on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not talking about just fear of, you know, am I going to be discriminated against? Are people going to look at me funny? Are people going to ridicule me? But actual physical violence against my person, 360 million. And of all the people in the world who are persecuted for their faith, three quarters of those, 75% are Christians. But the thing is that we don't know that. In the West, that doesn't make the news channels, it doesn't make CNN, it doesn't make the, the, the broadcast news. We just don't hear about it. And we don't realize how constant and ongoing this is. Can you give an example of somewhere where Christians are actually in danger, physical danger? Like where? what's an example of that? Sure. Uh, let's start with Nigeria. Nigeria is considered by Open Doors, which is a Christian persecution monitoring or watchdog organization. According to them, uh, Nigeria is the place where you're most likely to die this year as a Christian because they have uh, deaths in the hundreds every single year simply for the fact of being Christian. And, and there it's a question of about 51 percent of the population of the country is Muslim, but it's a very uh, aggressive form of Islam. Uh, many of whom believe that the country should be completely Muslim and believe that Christians have no right to be in Nigeria. And so you have an ongoing uh, violence against, uh, they'll, they'll sweep into Christian villages, they will interrupt Christian services and, and slay the, the priest or presiding pastor. Uh, this is something that, that is happening constantly. In fact, if, if I can take just one second, I'll give you a really good example of this. In March 2019, Everybody knew because on the front page of every newspaper that in Christchurch, New Zealand, a crazed maniac had broken into two mosques and shot up a bunch of Muslims. He killed 51 Muslims. It was absolutely horrific. But what you don't know, because this was everywhere, so everybody knew about it. During that same two-week period leading up to that, 120 Christians were killed in Nigeria, and no one ever heard because it did not make its way not to page one, but to any of the pages, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, it was just absent uh, because it's considered not to be news or in some way not relevant to people in the West. So you said 75% of, was it 75% of people who are being persecuted for the religion are Christian? Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. So why is now, of course, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. So perhaps that bumps their numbers up, so to speak. Sure, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, but why is it, though, that Christians specifically, like in Nigeria and other places, why are they being persecuted? Is it mostly religious, political, uh, or other reasons? Well, it's a, it's a multitude of motives, and we and we can look at several of the biggest ones. Uh, one of the largest is radical Islam, without a doubt, and that is, you know, we've seen that a lot with the uprise of, of ISIS, the Islamic State, and in these other cases, all these different offshoots, like in Nigeria, this Boko Haram, and then there are the Fulani uh, Muslim raiders in the in the middle of the country. So Islam is is a huge one still worldwide. Uh, a sec in fact, if you look at the the ten countries where it's most dangerous to be a Christian, eight out of those 10 are Muslim dominated populations. So that shows you kind of uh, how important that particular driver is. Another huge one is atheistic communism. Atheistic communism, for example, in North Korea, it's illegal to own a Bible. If you're caught with a Bible, you'll be thrown in jail. You can be summarily killed. Uh, and there's nobody is gonna get in trouble for killing a Christian who had a, or if you try to convert someone else or talk to them about Jesus Christ, you set yourself up for the same the same punishment. In China, even though there's a veneer of religious freedom, they like to say that they practice it. Uh, Christianity is completely controlled. There's surveillance in churches. They have they make sure that that preachers abide by a tone and a content that that congeals well with uh, their their form of Maoist uh, socialism. And if it doesn't, they will be thrown in jail. Um, there you cannot belong to any offshoot of Christianity that isn't official that isn't approved by the state. Um, now they just now, this is brand new news. This is only two weeks old. They've introduced a government run app uh, that every Christian have to ha has to have. If you want to go to a Sunday service, you have to register not only on the app, you have to register for every single time now that you want to go to church. So they keep tabs, not only where you are, where you're going, how many times you do it. They know who active Christians are. And there are monitors at the door now of churches to see whether you actually have permission to be at that service or not from the government. Uh, so those are two big ones, atheistic communism and radical Islam. Another one though, that we should really take note of is rising a radical or extreme secularism. And this isn't the nice secularism of we respect the autonomy of the state, a non-confessional state, which is kind of the good form of secularism, but a much more aggressive form where religion is looked upon as an enemy, where Christians are seen to be bigots because of their morality, uh, you know, following this Bronze Age book, the Bible, with all these antiquated notions that have long since been, super, since been superseded by, by modernity and, and reasonable men and women. And so there is a skepticism that borders on aggression in the modern world in the West, in the first world, if you will, uh, because of this sort of radical form of secularism that thinks that religion should be crowded out of the public square. So real quick about the, the, the China um, app, what is the reason they gave that, I mean, I, I realize it's probably just for persecution's sake, but what reason did they give for having to register to go to a religious service? Well, they quite openly say uh, that all religion in China has to be sinicized. In other words, it has to be something that that is completely conforming to uh, the reigning belief of the, of the communist Chinese Communist Party. You cannot be preaching things that go against what the state stands for. In other words, the state basically has a religion of its own. It has a, a, a natant Chinese religion, kind of like the old Roman Empire in a way. As long as you, you play nice with us, as long as you recognize our official state religion, which is a totalitarianism, uh, then you're okay, as long as you, you go along with that. That's why they have you know, the, the friendly Catholic Church, the patriotic Catholic Church and the underground Catholic Church, the, the patriotic Catholic Church in China is the one whose bishops all uh, pledge conformity with the, the Communist Party. They they only preach things that go along with state communism and the underground church, which is getting harder and harder to be a member of that, because even Rome, unfortunately, even the Vatican has kind of distanced itself from those who have always been faithful to the Vatican, even in times of, of very harsh persecution. Uh, they're, they're finding it very hard now because they're, they're really being ostracized. They, they are not legal anymore. And if they are caught holding services of any kind, they can be arrested. In fact, there are many in jail because of that today. Yeah, I want to get back to that in a minute about what the Vatican's doing about some of this stuff. But I wanted to ask a little bit, something you mentioned about like radical secularism. I mean, I remember back maybe 20 years ago, kind of the rise of the new atheist and you had like the Richard Dawkins and the Sam Harris's that were much more aggressive in their 
uh, attacks on Christianity, on religious belief in general. But it was still, though, in the in the sphere of ideas. I mean, Sam Harris wasn't calling for anybody to be persecuted, not, nor was Richard Dawkins. And so I want to ask, what is that kind of the evolution of how persecution of Christians happens? Like, how does it go from being it's acceptable to to now you're getting arrested for it. How does that typically occur? Yeah, and, and so quickly, uh, as you say, this right. is a very recent phenomenon. It is, it's gone at such a, a dizzying pace, really. Uh, it's happened, obviously, in our lifetime, not only our lifetime, in our recent recent past. Um, but everything starts with ideas, doesn't it? I mean, ideas have consequences. And when you start, this becomes the, the mode at, in the academy. So you have universities and in institutions of higher learning where it's looked upon as suspicion. You're a bit of a troglodyte, a bit of an obscurantist, if you still adhere to those, you know, now antiquated beliefs. So you, it starts with you're a little bit on the outskirts of, you know, right thinking people. And it moves from that to be something where you're, you're looked upon as a little bit of a big, a little bit hostile, a little bit someone who's holding up progress. Or nowadays, too, I mean, in very recent years, we've switched on things like gay marriage. It's only since 2015 with Obergefell that even a majority of Americans think this is fine. But that, you know, Americans change so quickly when the laws change that nowadays it's very out of favor to say that gay marriage is not marriage. And yet that is the Orthodox Christian position. And it's one now where Christians, instead of looking like we're very mainstream because that's what everybody believed, you're all of a sudden this kind of fringe element that is that is a hater or a homophobe or whatever it might, whatever et, 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 whatever label they're gonna put on you uh, simply because of your Christian beliefs that people have been believing for you know a couple thousand years. Um, but this is something, and then obviously the transgender question, the abortion question has always been a big one. Uh, if you're pro-life, that's somehow suspicious. You're anti-woman, you're anti-women's rights, you want to hold women back. Uh, so these are the things that are now often associated with Christ Christianity. And then they bring in other political things. I don't know anyone, for example, who identifies, self-identifies as a Christian nationalist. Uh, and yet, apparently, we're all Christian nationalists yeah. now. I mean, anybody who says, you know, I believe in Christianity, I believe this was very important to the founding fathers, and I believe that, you know, people came to America in the first place for the sake of religious freedom, to be able to practice their religion freely, you're looked upon as, oh, so you're a Christian nationalist. You want everybody to believe, you want a theocracy. And you say, no, I really don't want a theocracy. I would really like just to be able to, you know, practice my faith freely and publicly. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, that's becoming more and more a minority position and one that is you know, severely under attack. Yeah. People kind of forget that in 2008, Barack Obama ran on the idea that marriage between a man and a woman. I mean, that was part of his uh, thing. And that was just and that was, you know, Biden was obviously the vice presidential candidate. And now it's like if you even suggest that, you, you know, you're, you're a bigot and, and you're and you're to be hated um, now. OK. Expanding a bit back again about the worldwide persecution of Christians, <clears throat> we know at the beginning that a lot of people in the West don't know about this. Why is it that this information is suppressed? Why is it, for example, that when Muslims are, are persecuted or killed or whatever, that, that makes the front pages everywhere? But if Christians are, it's completely ignored. Well, I think there are several reasons. One is the fact that it's so rare that a Christian goes and shoots up a mosque. Honestly, frankly, that's news in kind of the classic sense because it doesn't happen every day. You know, it's something that is so rare that it, it deserves, you know, front page, front page billing. Secondly, and, and in the case of, for example, Muslim hostility toward Christians in a place like Nigeria, if you reported on every single death of a Christian, you would be reporting on it on a weekly basis, sometimes several times a week. So that's that's part of it. It's not news in the sense that it's just too frequent. Uh, a second reason is I think, you know, and we talk about race, a, a true form of racism is this idea that, you know, what happens in Africa, they're all a bit backward anyway. You know, that doesn't really matter. That's not in the modern world. That's not something we would do. If they hack each other up with machetes, well, those are vestiges of, of, a, of a primitive tribal uh, sort of lifestyle that, that allows for that sort of thing. I think that's one as well. And I think, frankly, there's another which is a little bit more insidious, which is that right now the, the reigning uh, thought pattern, I think, among the left is we don't want to give Christians a pass and we don't want to advance their causes because they stand up against things that we want to, to push forward our agenda. And so if they're persecuted somewhere, we're just going to pretend that didn't happen. I think there's a lot of that. I think there's a lot of just saying, well, that's not we're not going to talk about. 
Christian martyrs. We're not going to talk about, you know, Christian suffering because that will just make them stronger. That will embolden them here. Okay. Now, a lot of times when, when somebody mentions, I know I've had this happen to me before, where I might mention some type of persecution of Christians here in the United States. Like, for example, uh, they, 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 they stand up for, for like against transgenderism or against uh, homosexual marriage like that, and they lose their job or something like that. And inevitably, you'll get the response, don't try to act like you're some martyr. You, you're not getting killed or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about the different levels of persecution that it's not all just being killed, but there, you mentioned in the book, the, uh, the white and, and then the red. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the range of persecution and what we mean when we talk about Christians being persecuted? Absolutely. But I'm going to I'm going to start with a little anecdote first, because what you the point you brought up right now is, is really, really important. Um, this is anecdotal. But if you look at Wikipedia, there's an actual page entry, an entire entry for Christian persecution complex. And it talks <laughs> about how Christians often think they're persecuted when they're not. And I remember when I first saw that, I thought, wow, that's a really that's a really bold thing to say, a nervy thing to say. Can you imagine putting in you know, a Jewish persecution complex as an entry in Wikipedia or a Muslim persecution complex, you'd be like, hey, this is real. You, Hey, that's really, you know, you can't do that to them. That's offensive. But with Christians, you get a pass because if somebody says Christians are persecuted, it's like, oh, you're just making that up. You're just a whiner. You know, why are you, why are you saying this? This is, you know, you just want to be like everybody else. So you want to feel persecuted, but you're really not. Because, in part, because this ignorance and because, in, in part because, you know, I, I think people, just, you know, don't like to don't like to think of this reality the way it is. And getting onto your point, though, there are many, many different forms. And when, you know, somebody like Amy Coney Barrett is up for a position on the U.S. District Court and she is grilled and hazed for her religious beliefs, so much so that Diane Feinstein, Senator Diane Feinstein, will say to her, the dog lives loudly in you, suggesting that she is not qualified to adjudicate in, in, a, in an unbiased manner because of her deeply felt and held religious beliefs, you have a serious problem. That is, that is harassment that really borders on persecution in, in a very active way, where Catholics or Christians are no longer seen as viable members of, of life. No seat at the table because, well, we know they're all gonna be bent by their, their crazy ideas. They're not gonna be able to think clearly. They're not gonna be rational. That's that borders on, on a very serious form of, of persecution. It is not always bloody. Um, sometimes it is, and sometimes look what happened recently with the FBI first targeting those who were protesting abortion clinics and rounding them up under RICO laws when they were not, for example, uh, prosecuting those who were bombing and, and, and vandalizing uh, pro-life centers and marriage centers. And secondly, when the FBI in its memo, which was released and they had to quickly back away from it, uh, targeting those who go to Latin mass is somehow likely to be plotting against the state, likely to be white supremacists, you know, because they like the Latin mass. I mean, where are we? What country? When all of a sudden we have the FBI wasting its energy and manpower on something that is so targeting a specific religious belief that is, you know, deeply Christian. So, I mean, this is real. You're right. We may not have a situation right now where Christians are being rounded up and beheaded or shot in front of a firing squad. But it's amazing, again, how quickly these things escalate. Yeah, I think that's that's the key point here is when we say that Christians, for example, in the West are being persecuted, we're not claiming that they're being killed. But like history has shown that you don't get to the killing stage first. <laughs> that's not stage one. That's the last stage, because first you have to deny them. So it's like you start off by saying that these people aren't we can't have them in government positions. We can't have them. Uh, do certain jobs, then all of a sudden we can't have them working. We have to, they have to lose their jobs. They have to lose their livelihood. And it just continues to get greater and greater until it does end up leading often to actual red persecution, bloody persecution. So it, it's like, are we not supposed to say anything? Or if we have a complex until we get to that last stage? I mean, right. just right. Well, we're, we're going to be like the frog boiling in the water. I mean, because at that point, it's too late. You know, at that right, point, right. there are riots yeah. in the streets and Christians being rounded up. It's too late. You know, that's what they complain about. You know, and, and rightly so in World War II, that there wasn't enough resistance early on when Jews were being deported. Jews were, you know, having to wear a special mark. I'm Jewish and things. That was long before the final solution. But, 
you know, it, the, the writing was already on the wall. And this is something I'm not trying to compare them in the sense that we're not we're not in that place. But this is the way these things escalate. And, and, and we'd be foolish to think that things aren't going to get any worse because every indication is that they're getting worse by the day. Right. Yeah. You de- you dehumanize the, the target first for a, a period of time. So people accept it that these people aren't really worthy of life or not worthy of, of the rights other people have. So let's talk a little bit though, more about like the West. Uh, there, so there's this outward extreme persecution in areas like Africa, the Middle East, things like that. How, what's it like in Europe as far as compared to America, uh, religious persecution of Christians in Europe? How's that? Uh, what's the status of that? Well, there are there are a couple items here. One, I, I think that our believe it or not in Europe, our situation of uh, free speech is actually worse in, than in the U.S. And in the U.S., it's getting worse. But here we're beyond that, where there are certain things you just cannot say. Um, for example, Rocco Bultodioni a few years ago was up for a position with the European uh, Court, and because he's a, he's a noted uh, jurist and just a very very smart man, he'd been a professor for many years, and it was known that he was, and this was prior to any sort of gay marriage, but it was known that he was a Christian, a serious Catholic. And he was asked, what is your personal belief about homosexuality? Is it a sin? And and he very carefully answered and said, yes, I believe as a Christian, as a Catholic, that homosexuality is a sin, as there are many sins, many sins that I commit every day. Sins are all around us. Uh, I do. But I would not let that influence. The law is the law. And one is when one is adjudicating the law, one is not trying to recreate the law or legislate from the bench. And that didn't matter. That was enough for him to be rejected from that post. Uh, so that's one area. The question of free speech and what you're allowed to say and what you can't is very serious. Uh, a second one that's been growing in these last few years is the amount of vandalism of Christian sites and churches, which is actually kind of scary. There, there are certain periods of the year when in France, several churches will be vandalized and profanated and some set a fire in the course of a week. Uh, and so this is not something that happens like once in a blue moon, but with a, with a certain regularity. The same is true in Germany. Um, in the north of Italy, this has become a problem. Um, so it's something also there that you see a, a real hostility, which is very clearly religiously motivated because this is against either Christian, sometimes it happens in Christian cemeteries, often Christian churches, and also defacing Christian monuments. That, And again, that's just one step away from that being people. Buildings are often the first target, and then you get people themselves being attacked. Who is doing that? Who's, who's desecrating the churches? Well, uh, according to, you know, it's very interesting because, for example, the French government has elected not to publicize motivations for these crimes, which is very strange in an age where we love the idea of hate crimes. Uh, They have chosen not to do that, in part because a number of the perpetrators have been Muslim. Uh, And as you know, with the the huge influx of Muslims over the last seven to 10 years, uh, that is something where there's a lot of hatred toward Christians among more radicalized Muslims. And when they see Christian churches, what they're not used to seeing us there in their place of origin, there is... uh, a sort of hostility shown in a very outward fashion. Uh, other times, though, I'd say numerically, as far as I can tell, just as high is, you know, a really radical form of atheistic secularism, where, again, uh, the Catholic Church, in particular, Christianity in general, are really seen as the enemy of the state, as, as, as a force for evil, as a force against progress, trying to bring us back to some horrific imaginary state of the past, um, and so, you know, anything that can be done to, you know, put them down is considered okay. So here in the States, I know like after 9-11, of course, and even a little bit before that, and it, there was the uh, thought among many conservative Christians, I would say probably, that radical Islam was uh, uh, oh. the main threat to Christianity and potential persecution of Christianity here in the United States. But really, I, I kind of you're suggesting it seems to me that it's probably more radical secularism here in at least the United States. It's probably the bigger uh, threat to Christianity. Would you agree with that or do you think it's, it's a combination or, or what? Oh, no, I think in the U.S., the, the radical uh, secularism is a far greater threat, far greater threat. And, and the worst part about it is, as we've seen, that there is there is the good and bad form of Christianity. So if you're willing to play nice and you're willing to not let 
uh, biblical morality, if you will, or church teaching influence the way you look at public morality, the way you look at laws, the way you look at the way society should be run and governed, then you're okay. So if you are you know, a liberal enough Catholic where oh, abortion's okay, gay marriage is okay, where these things are all fine, transgenderism, hey, you know, love is love and whoever you think you are, whatever you identify, that's fine. So in other words, if you're willing to deny some very core anthropological and moral tenets of Christianity, you're a good Christian. You're the kind, oh, you've got a rosary in your pocket, Joe Biden. Well, good for you. You're a, you're the kind of Christian we like. And, and everybody's going to pat you on the back. Nobody's going to attack you. Nobody's going to try to ostracize you because you are playing nice with that form of radical secularism. As soon as that starts coloring the way that not only you think, but the way you vote, the way you speak, the way you try to convince others of your arguments, then you become a danger to the state. You become a danger to the agenda, to the program that some people see as moving forward inexorably. And, and Christianity is in a way the last you know, finger in the dike, if you will, that is, that is holding back this, this, this avalanche that they would like to see happen. And, and I think that, again, that is going to get stronger before it gets weaker. There's no sign of that in any way letting up. And I think also what we're seeing with the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, these non-affiliated, non-religious people in the U.S., this turning away from religion is just going to make the situation worse. As there are more and more atheists and agnostics, those are easily brought over to a very hostile form of atheism that really hates Christianity. Yeah, I think a, re a religious person is going to be naturally, at least in today's world, naturally more sympathetic to another religious person, even if it's not the same religion. And so they're not going to really be happy about another religion being persecuted necessarily. Whereas, like you said, the nuns, they don't have that that sympathy necessarily for religious people. And it's kind of like, well, those people are, are kind of weird anyway. And ah, they probably deserved whatever uh, persecution, whatever uh, harassment they get. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think that's, it, it, in fact, I have an article coming out of crisis here pretty soon about the the significant increase in the nuns in the past 20 years. I mean, if you look at the charts after 20, after the year 2000, the, the number of people who identify who say they go to a church, a synagogue or a mosque, they're a member of it has just dropped from like over 70% to under 50% in just 20 years. And yeah. it, re it remained in the 70% for like ever since they started doing this in the 1930s and all of a sudden it just started dropping. So I think that's a, uh, like you said, that kind of sets the table for increasing persecution because you can't identify with, with these people. If you're not religious yourself, you just look at religious people as kind of odd and weird. Um, that, and that, is such, that is a super important point that you bring up, Eric. And, and, you know, we see this another way where it's very, very evident is the way religious freedom is treated. Uh, which was considered America's first freedom. It's in the First Amendment. This is something that had pride of place among the founding fathers. They believed that this was, I mean, this is the reason America came to be, was a, the whole idea of religious freedom. It was a freedom apart. It was a right apart. And nowadays, for example, when religious freedom hits up against, you know, a baker doesn't want to bake a cake celebrating uh, a gay marriage, then it's looked upon, well, no, these are two rights that could collide and none should take precedence. This idea of, of conscience or religious belief somehow being superior and, and getting sort of privileged uh, position in the, in the rights of man is no longer readily held on to. And again, it's atheists and agnostics who are going to be the first ones to say, why should that get any special treatment? That's why you can have a group like the Satanic Temple say, well, abortion is now our, our sacrament. We have a religious right. We'd like a religious exemption to be able to have abortions because this is part of our belief system. Yeah, insane. OK, I want to uh, shift a little bit to Pope Francis and the Vatican. Obviously, Pope yeah. Francis, he's the head of the, the Catholic Church, and he's somewhat in one way the moral head of Christianity in, in the world. But there's some I know he has said some things at times about Christian persecution, but I feel like there's some ways that he's, I'd just be blunt, he's not helping. Uh, let's talk first about China, the relationship that the Vatican has, has established with the patriarch Chinese church and how that undermines the, the, the faithful Catholics there who have been loyal to Rome and above the government. Uh, what's going on there? Why in the world does the Vatican seem to be uh, cozying up to the communists rather than the persecuted Catholics? Well, this is this is a this is a mystery, right? This is something that I think has, you know, all serious Catholics really, really up in arms over. It, it has been so problematic, and I think that it's enough, honestly, this one issue 
to really seriously tarnish his legacy, the way history will look back on him. This is this is going to be a very serious blot on his record because his desire to reestablish diplomatic ties with Beijing has been so central and so paramount that he's been willing to overlook horrendous things. And this is true both in Hong Kong and in China, his abandonment of, of Cardinal Joseph Zen, his, his refusal to say anything about the persecution of the Uyghur Muslims, which would normally be right up his alley because right. several times a year he runs through the, you know, the, the litany of the injustices in the world, the terrible things that are happening. And yet he, he tiptoes around these serious issues. And then we get to the one that's so big for us as Christians and Catholics, which is really the abandonment, the betrayal, if you will, and this is Joseph uh, Cardinal Zen's words, the betrayal of the underground church by saying, oh, yeah, well, nowadays, if you want to become a member of the Patriotic Catholic Association, you can do that. Basically, meaning that the whole rationale that all these faithful Catholics had in the past was to say, no, we can't, we have to be faithful to Rome, we're not allowed to do that. The Pope says, oh, go ahead and do that if you want. But they know that that is simply giving into the ideology of the party. They know they're going to have to abandon a lot of their you know, core Christian beliefs, at least publicly, in order to do that. And they feel completely stabbed in the back over this. And as far as I can tell, the only real reason that the Pope has been doing this is because he really, really wants to be that guy that was able to thaw relations, diplomatic relations. And because he always says, you know, if we can just open up dialogue, everything's going to be fine. But I'll tell you, since 2018, when that first document was signed, allowing the Communist Party a say in the naming of bishops in, in, in uh, China, things have gotten way worse. They haven't gotten better. And Xi Jinping, I think, is laughing all the way. I think he, he thinks that the Pope is very weak and he, he plays him like a ukulele. And, and, I, and he, he just uses that, you know, good natured desire for dialogue and encounter in this culture of encounter to simply say, well, we're just going to go out of business and we're going to take total control of these things. Yeah, I think it's, it is that exaltation of dialogue as the solution to every problem that if we just talk. Sometimes people, they're going to take advantage of you. And I think that's exactly what China is doing at this point uh, to the Vatican. Now, when it comes to Islam, this pope has obviously been very uh, friendly with Islam. Uh, I had a podcast just recently talking about the Abrahamic family house and, and of course, the Abu Dhabi Declaration in which uh, he talks very much like Islam and, and Catholicism are two sides of the same coin, essentially. Now, one could argue, and I, and I, I think this is, I understand this argument at least, that one of the reasons they do that is they want to promote a, a peaceful vein of Islam to, to kind of uh, ostracize the more radical vein. That if you make, if you kind of uh, work with the the muslim leaders who are peaceful who aren't trying to kill christians then that will make islam more like that and that's the reason why he 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 would do this and why others i mean i think that's kind of like was the thought process behind like george w bush when they after 9 11 was like okay we're going to try to talk about islam like it's like it's peaceful that might then make it peaceful would you say that's a valid argument or do you think he's he's missing the boat by not calling out uh, the is the the radical Islamic attacks on Christ, Catholics and Christians throughout the world. Well, I, I think that what you just characterized, I think that is exactly his approach, and I think that you can re make a very strong case of why that approach should be followed, at least in part. Uh, you obviously do not want to demonize all the members of a, of an enormous religion like Islam, many of whom are very peaceful, many of whom are very devout, and and honestly who are admirable in the way they live out their faith and something that we as Christians could, you know, take, you know, take some lessons from, I think, in their, in their fidelity to prayer, the fidelity to certainly of, of the, of the, the things like fasting and other external uh, parts of their religion. But on the other hand, you cannot do that. And at the same time, not call out the abuses. And I think that also you can gently urge the leaders of these more peaceful factions and groups. In Indonesia, there's a big movement of peaceful Islam going on there. These are, these are great signs, but urge them to stand side by side and shoulder to shoulder with you in calling out these abuses, in calling out these radical forms, saying that is not who we are. That is a misinterpretation of the Quran. This is a misinterpretation of, of our, at least where we are today, whether historically or not, this is where we are today. Uh, and that hasn't really happened, unfortunately. In fact, so much so that when it's been brought up, brought to the Pope's attention, you know, this form of, of Islamic terrorism, he says, no. He said, there is no 
Muslim terrorism. He said, if you talk about Muslim terrorism, and I'm quoting him just about exactly here, if you're going to talk about Muslim uh, terrorism, you have to talk about Christian terrorism because we, we do the same thing. There are fundamentalists, he used that same term in that, in that little interview he gave, we, there are Christian fundamentalists and there are Islamic fundamentalists, and they're just the same, right? But the fact of the matter is, which he seems to ignore, the historical reality right now is that nobody's going around shooting people and saying, praise be Jesus Christ. And yet we have many people taking machetes to people and saying, Allahu Akbar, you know, God is great, Allah is great. And this is, this is a mantra used to commit violence as believed by them to be actually fulfilling the will of God in that sort of anti-Christian violence. So that needs to be denounced in no uncertain terms. It needs to be recognized for what it is. It's not just like Christianity. And I'm sorry, these are very different things. And that's not to, again, demonize all, all Muslims by a long shot, but there is a certain type of, of, of Islam that is very, very dangerous and very, very uh, problematic for the world. Yeah, I mean, dialogue has to be in the truth. And so you have to acknowledge realities. And, and the reality is that Islamic fundamentalism uh, blows up buildings, kills people, whereas your Christian fundamentalism might be, you know, some backwards people in, in, in the deep south or something like that who aren't probably harming anybody. Right. <laughs> uh, there's, right. a, there's a big difference between the two. Now, OK, so the question becomes, how do we respond? I, I brought this up before we, we uh, started recording. I, I Last night I was teaching uh, my high school catechism class at our parish and somehow the, the topic of persecution, persecution came up and some of the kids were asking, well, what, what is the proper Catholic response to persecution? Do you flee? Do you fight back? Do you, uh, do you accept it uh, willingly? I mean, what exactly should we do? Let's talk about in the West because that's where most of our audience is. What should we do about this coming per uh, Christian persecution? Well, I think that in our history, we have to draw lessons from our history as a believing community. I think there are several virtues that need to coexist in the Christian, and they complement one another. They're in sometimes in tension with one another, but they complement one another. One is courage. Courage, you know, is not the most popular of the of the virtues today, but one being willing to face dangerous, threatening situations and to stand up for the truth and for what is right, even knowing that that may have fallout that is very negative for me. So that's part of it. Uh, a second part of it is even something that, you know, St. Paul talks about in rejoicing. You looked at the apostles who were flogged by the Sanhedrin and went away giving thanks to God that they'd been found worthy to suffer something for the name. So there's a certain joy in experiencing something that unites us to Christ, who is the first to suffer the passion and death. And we make up for what is lacking you know, in the church, that suffering of Christ. But another very, very, very important one is to stand up for the truth and stand up for religious liberty and religious freedom. And this is something we're not demanding privileges for Christians. We're saying human dignity demands that people be allowed to live out their faith in private and in public and that they not be coerced into doing things that they know to be morally evil. And this is something that we have to stand up for, absolutely stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters and say, this is wrong to do this. Right. And and sometimes it demands the courage also of, of standing up and defending. Uh, you don't, you know, if some robber or thief comes into your house or some murderer comes into your house and wants to attack your wife and your children, you stand up and you try to defend them. And, and there is that in the church as well. There's a difference between what we accept as persecution in our own selves and persecution against the church and the community of believers that we're also called to, to stand up for. You know, I'm always taken by the fact people always say, well, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. And I said, this is true. And that is that is a part of Catholic and Christian teaching. But it's also true that when he was arrested, the first thing that happened, they slapped him on the cheek. And he said, what did I say that was wrong? If I didn't say anything that was untrue, why do you slap me? He immediately countered that with, instead of giving the other cheek, he said, why are you, why are you smacking me if what I said was the truth? So I think we need all these different virtues to coexist in us. We need to pray to have the strength to face whatever will come, as Jesus told us to do, pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters to learn about them. We need to have the patience to be long suffering and to be able to bear with uh, the difficulties and the cross that is present in our lives, but also the courage to stand up to it. And, you know, honestly, the, the forthrightness to speak the truth in season and out of season and, and to call out the evils that are that are committed against Christians as well. 
Where would you put then the virtue? And it is a virtue that people don't like to call it a virtue, but virtue of prudence. So let's give mm-hmm. the example, uh, a de- Catholic dad, he's got, let's just say seven kids. He's working a job. Uh, he's, you know, he's uh, the, the mom staying home, homeschooling the kids, whatever. And uh, so he's the sole breadwinner for the family, supporting his family. He's working a job at, at some Fortune 500 company and they start shoving down let's say, uh, gay marriage or, or transgenderism. And he has to attend seminars about how boys can be girls and things like that. Well, if he speaks up, he knows there's a chance he's going to lose his job and he can't support his family. Uh, so, and I, and I hear this from people and, and yeah. this is, like, this is really this happening is real. today in America and I'm sure other places. And so what is, I mean, there, there's the, the, the call to courage, which, you know, I, I, I agree with, and I, I'm, totally with you, but where does prudence lie? Like, should he, I mean, should these people always speak up? I mean, what, what, what do they do? Because if nobody speaks up, then what's going to end up happening is we're going to, we're going to be on the path to, to full scale persecution where losing your job is the least of your worries. But at the same time, he has a responsibility to uh, his family that God has given him to, to support them. So where does that all lie? <laughs> Yeah, well, Eric, that's a great question. That's the reason prudence exists as a virtue, right? If everything were black and white, where you had a rule that says, whenever you're in this situation, do this, prudence wouldn't really matter, right? Because prudence is all about weighing and balancing um, all those different factors that you bring that you bring up. And obviously, there's a decision that needs to be made between husband and wife in the first place, looking at the reality of the situation. Um, a very important Catholic principle that comes into play, and that is the idea of cooperation and evil. Up to what point if I go along with this, am I actually in some way uh, committing evil by sharing in the evil of another? Or am I simply suffering from an evil that another is imposing on me? You know, up to what point do I have an obligation in this instance to stand up and say something? And usually Catholic teaching would basically say, you you don't, I mean, there's not a hard fast rule where you you should have said something there necessarily. Uh, There is a prudential space and there are other ways to go about it whether it's just talking with uh, some of your fellow employees behind the scenes and saying, isn't that, you know, I felt a little bit uncomfortable in there. Wasn't this, this, because there are going to be other people of like mind there that also need the support of a fellow believer, someone who finds that this is an overbearing imposition, something that the company should not be doing. So I think you could definitely argue both sides there. Some might feel called to a very overt witness in that instance and be willing to you know, to suffer whatever it takes. Others would say, you know, at this moment, my first obligation is to my family and I'm not actually committing evil by doing this. And so for the moment, I'm just going to have to grit my teeth and see what I can make up for in my apostolic ventures elsewhere in my life and in other things to bring the message of Christ forward, where at this moment, I have to just hold my peace. Yeah, actually, a story this this happened recently. A friend of mine, a uh, Christian, worked at a, a large Fortune 500 company, went to one of the typical meetings you have to go to and and the speaker got up and it was i came it was something work related the, the talk was but the speaker got up and the first thing he said was like uh something about i am gay i am a gay man and he wanted to make sure everybody i want everybody to know i'm a gay man and then it had nothing to do with the purpose of right. anything this is a corporate thing and so my friend who was a christian he was obviously upset by this and so he did end up he he, he emailed the man uh, afterwards and said, I really felt that was inappropriate and had nothing to do with this. And, 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 you know, why did you do this type of thing? The guy actually apologized to him and he said, wow. you're right. I should, I, I don't I, I shouldn't have done that. And, and I was like, wow. So I think sometimes the reaction we get isn't exactly what we expect. Uh, I, who knows why the person decided the, the man decided to declare that at the beginning, maybe he was pressured to, maybe he had just seen, you know, some gay activists tell somebody you always have to do this or whatever. But uh, he said, yeah, it was he ended up deciding he ended up apologizing it wasn't appropriate to do that. So I, I do guess. think yeah. um, I do think we can kind of assume. I mean, you know, we were joking about the Christian uh, persecution complex, but I do think sometimes we we do tend to think the reaction is always going to be persecution. And sometimes it might actually be we, we change hearts and, and people do come around and say, you know, that you, you're, you know, you're right in this situation. So we have to take oh, that. That's, that an, excellent, that's well. an excellent point. And I, and I think that, you know, it's a super important point because we're not called to look upon our fellow citizens as the enemy, right? I mean, this is not meant to set up a confrontational uh, relationship whereby everyone we're always, you know, in this warfare. Uh, that's not the way we're meant to live. 
Uh, sometimes warfare is imposed on us, but as St. Paul says, really, the battle is happening at the level of, you know, the principalities and powers. This is something against, it's, it's a spiritual war. And it's not that my brother or my co-citizen, my neighbor is my enemy. There are ideas that are that are very problematic and there is there is a warfare going on that is spiritual, but it doesn't make these other people who are souls that Christ intends for them to be saved and to be in heaven together with us. Uh, they're, they're there to be saved. They're that not there to be, you know, fought only for the sake of, you know, fighting that other human being. Right. We're on a rescue mission more than we are trying to battle against them. They're not our enemies. The, 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 the evil one is our enemy. Uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up here. Uh, I just want to encourage people with the coming per Christian persecution, uh, why things are getting worse and how to prepare for what is to come by Thomas Williams. Uh, Christ Publications, it will be, I'll have a link to, you can buy it directly from our website. Um, and so I really encourage you to pick up this book. Is there anything else you want to leave us with, Thomas, about uh, what we should do as, as Christians uh, to, to face this coming Christian persecution? Well, you know, I, I think that at least for me spiritually, I think the time of Lent, in which we're in the midst of right now, it's just a time to remember some of those hard passages of, of the gospel that are, you know, the cross is present. And, and one of the forms the cross takes is some persecution in our lives. And I think that that is meant to mold us into better disciples, mold us into better Christians. So as much as we, you know, fight against this and lament that it exists, at the same time, you know, Jesus also uses those tools to make us into that that more perfect image of himself. So I think I think there's a very positive side to be taken from this, especially during Lent and especially the persecution that we feel in our own personal lives. Not so much, you know, what we're seeing overseas or wherever else it might be happening, but those little things that those little pins and jabs that hurt us and hurt our pride. Those are great opportunities. Amen. Amen. Where can people find out other than the book? Where can people find out about uh, other things? Because you're very involved with a lot of stuff. So other things that you're that you're up, up to. Uh, well, maybe. All right. So I have a website. www.thomasdwilliams.com is a pretty okay. easy place. Uh, I have a Twitter handle at TD Williams Rome. So I'm Rome based, as you mentioned, and uh, that should pretty much do it. Great. And I'll put links to that in the description so people can uh, can find out all the stuff that you're up to. I really appreciate you coming on the program today, Thomas. Thanks so much, Eric. It's a tough topic, but I'm really glad yeah. we were able to talk about it. Amen. Amen. OK, everybody, until next time, 